In this chapter, we're looking at the period between 1790 and 1914, uh, before World War I. In 1790, Congress passed the Naturalization Act of 1790. Uh, this is the first law in the U.S. to define the eligibility of citizenship by naturalization, where free whites were considered citizens after two years of residence in the United States. This means that African Americans, Native Americans, and, and other racialized groups that were here at the time were excluded from citizenship, denying them the opportunities afforded to uh, citizens uh, during this time period. And this has had great negative impacts on racialized communities when it comes to planning. Uh, think about property rights, uh, residential, housing, uh, transportation, etc. During the 1880s and 1910s, there was a mass migration of Europeans to the United States. An estimated 20 million immigrants from Europe arrived during this time period. Now, that's a lot of people. And given the time, we see that with such a high influx of immigrants, uh, particularly coming from Southern and Eastern Europe, a uh, change the demographics, of the United States, in particular, we're talking about cities. In terms of the impacts of this mass migration of Europeans to the United States, Jacob Rees, in his classic book, How the Other Half Lives, focused on documenting the lives of these poor immigrants coming from Europe. In cities like New York, he not only took pictures of the abject poverty of European immigrants, but also wrote about them focusing on the deplorable and overcrowding conditions of housing, for example. In these two striking images, we see on, on the one hand, uh, entire families living in one-bedroom apartments where there's no ventilation, no windows, no indoor plumbing. In the other photo, which also is part of this classic book, we see the deplorable housing conditions at the time where a mass migration of immigrants were concentrated in places like New York and other major cities in the United States. While the United States embraced European immigration with open arms, at the same time the government passed a law specifically prohibiting Chinese as a racialized group from legally entering the United States. We see this anti-Chinese hysteria depicted in this image where the Democrats are proclaiming that the white man is on top and is good for the country. And this is something that continues to the present where we see with the coronavirus, uh, with the former administration, uh, blaming everything on the Chinese and creating anti-Chinese sentiment. So this is not uh, something of the past, this is also, also something of the present. In 1892, Ellis Island opened. The famous Ellis Island as an immigration processing center, opens the door to the ma mass migration of Europeans, while at the same time excluding Chinese immigrants, as I previously noted. To be able to handle the mass migration of immigrants, uh, we see activists like Jane Addams uh, in 1889 co-found the settlement house, uh, the whole house in Chicago. Uh, this house, or the whole house, provided services to recent immigrants, uh, European immigrants in particular, promoted assimilation, the Americanization of immigrants, but was also in favor of prohibiting more immigration or restrictions against immigrants that, that were arriving. Here's a photo of uh, the whole house in Chicago, where you can see how large it is where thousands of immigrants were, were served by Jane Addams and her staff. Another influential person during this time period in 1906 uh, was Upton Sinclair. He was an influential uh, progressive, and he wrote a great novel uh, called The Jungle that had positive ramifications in public policy in the United States. Uh, this book exposed the terrible working conditions of European immigrants in unsanitary meatpacking plants in Chicago. Because of the uproar it created in the national exposure, 
This led to uh, federal reform, regulation, and intervention in meatpacking plants. What's important here is prior to this book, when it came to the meatpacking industry and other sectors, the government was not regulating them. So people were getting sick, people were dying, uh, and they didn't know why. And thanks to Upton Sinclair and his novel, we now see or benefit you know, from federal intervention in how our food is being processed and delivered to us, to the present. In 1913, California passed alien land laws, which is also included in 1920. Uh, California passed these laws to ban so-called aliens from owning and leasing agricultural land. This racist law was initiated by the dominance of Japanese immigrants and Japanese American farmers who were outcompeting the white farmers. While Japanese were working as groups and using their networks, whites were working as individuals and looking out for their self-interest. Therefore, the Japanese had a competitive edge when it came to agriculture in California. To dismantle this, the farmers petitioned the state government to pass a law to prohibit Japanese immigrants and, and Japanese Americans because of the racism for owning these lands, therefore they were taken away from them. In 1914, World War I starts. As a result, we see a halt of European immigration to the United States. Uh, here's an image of, of the devastation of World War I. This is very important because prior to that, we had in a short time period, over 20 million Europeans coming to the United States. If it wasn't for World War I, that would have continued, and the United States today would have been more of a European uh, colony than it is today in terms of its diversity. In 1818, World War I ends, and we see a devastated Europe uh, forced to rebuild. As I wrap up this chapter, uh, in the next chapter, I'll be discussing key events uh, during the pre-World War II era.